I would like to ask you also, how do you feel your, how do you feel your experiences with uh, meditation, however, however successful or unsuccessful, how do you feel they helped you during these experiences? That's a, that's a very good question. And vice versa, how did those experiences help my meditation? I think ah. they, they're both, uh, they have in some kind of a good loop, I think. You're living in 2200. I didn't even think of that. The, uh, I think the meditation did help. Um, and it may be subtle and it's maybe not hard, easy to describe how or why, but it maybe allowed me to stay with the experience a little bit more steadily. Um, you know, meditation is kind of a focus, uh, a mind focus you, is one way to sort of describe it. You can focus on an object, but there's also open open awareness meditation where you it's like you're sitting on a, on a train looking out the window and the, the scenery goes by. You just watch it. You don't judge it. You don't react to it. You just watch it. But that's also a kind of focus. So I think it can have a concentration, ability to help your concentration, ability to help you steady yourself. As you don't get carried away so much by, you know, something jumping up at you in your unconscious. Not that you push it away, but you, you can watch it come. And, and be with it, allow it to, to do what it needs to do. So I think the meditation can help you in that way. Uh, I, I do. So I really do I encourage it. We can talk about different kinds of meditation. but I would love to. But uh, that's, I think it is a helpful practice, and it may take a while for that to develop. And then for me, at least in my particular case, uh, the psychedelic-assisted uh, therapy uh, made a big difference in my meditation, how deep I could go. Uh, being able to visualize spiritual light uh, just totally it like uh, turned me up a whole nother notch or another level or however you want to say it. It was extremely, um, extremely valuable and, and beautiful and, and, and that felt healing too. Uh, one of my therapists does a lot of meditation and he just said, well, you just, uh, you know, you rem remove the block, you know, and then it just allowed me to open up much more my meditation quickly became much deeper. I wanted to ask you as well, somebody who definitely has more experience than me in this, in this domain is, how do you get past this? This is actually what I forgot earlier. How do you get past this, this seeming paradox of trying to meditate? How, how, how does one get past this? Because, you know, hopefully you understand what I'm saying here. I'm sitting down and I have the intent to self better. And yet that seems to actually be a production of the entire ego construct or whatever you might want to call it. I'm sitting there trying to convince myself I'm now my higher self. Sometimes it feels like, especially me, you know, I, I don't have even a year of solid, consistent meditation. So really I'm convinced I'm essentially fooling myself. I'm, you know, I, I've translocated to the higher self, the higher Quentin. Well, you know, it's a, uh... I think techniques are helpful, especially in the beginning. Well, at any time, but um, especially in the beginning. And there's some good ones about watching your breath and, um, excuse me, just coming back to your breath when your mind, after your mind wanders. And really important thing is to be kind to yourself when your mind wanders. Because we, even though, like I was saying earlier, you know, an instructor, whether you have an in-person instructor or you read a book or watch a video, whatever, They'll say, oh, don't worry about your mind wandering. It's normal. It's okay. It's all good. Just come on back to your breath. And that's easy um, advice to give, but difficult to actually take in at a deep level. You might be able to take it in for a few times, and then, then you go like, well, I'm just sitting here thinking about the laundry, or I'm thinking about what Joe said to me. I'm Joe wasting Joe, time. You know, and I'm like, my goodness, 10, 20 minutes just went by, and I was in Paris or wherever, you know, I went. And, uh, and then you get frustrated, and that's natural. Um, so I think just knowing that that is natural and um, knowing that we have, especially because of our history, we have this I'm not good enough kind of thing for most of us. You know, I got to do better or, uh, you know, if something's not safe or I can't trust this process or something makes it unstable. Uh, and that's how we, we kind of lose our way. We can't stay with it. We get frustrated, give up, or uh, we maybe torture ourselves over our, our stray thoughts. So learning how to just be calm and relax and, and uh, believe that um, believe you're a beautiful person and uh, that, you're, that you're normal and that all this is normal. 
and then uh, and then watch your breath. Uh, I think is a good beginning, a beginner's uh, activity. And don't worry about mind wandering. Just gently come back to your breath. So it's a it's a form of almost just self acceptance of of the of what's going to be almost a failed attempt at what you think it's going to be. Just fully knowing these will be the trials and tribulations of the of the attempt to meditate. Right. And, and the, the phrase okay you said was the phrase you said was perfect self acceptance. Mm. That's right. And is that uh, does that extend to acceptance of circumstance and acceptance of uh, what's your view on the role of acceptance in our lives? Oh man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guru, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, guru, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, to the extent we can take that lesson, uh, because we're going to have uh, life is going to have ups and downs for everybody, right? And especially when we have tough moments, um, it's hard to uh, accept that uh, um, it's difficult for us. And to have compassion, self-compassion, self-love um, is, uh, is not easy, especially when you haven't been taught that as a child. Uh, you have to be correct. You have to do things right uh, or it's not safe. Uh, these things, then it becomes, it's really hard to be steady. And, uh, and there are situations where it just really is tough, and you have to understand that. For example, uh, death of, a, of a, a close relative is an example, where grieving is natural. Um, and if you if you take the idea, well, you know, I, you know, I can just push it away, you know, whatever. Well, it's just not natural. Uh, you have to accept it that this is part of life, and grieving is part of life, and you just have to go into it, and and you do it, and it takes some time, and to just being gentle and loving towards ourselves, self-accepting. That, that's a great example um, from my personal life of how psilocybin, in particular, can bring things from the unconscious to the surface. I had a grandfather pass away, I believe two and a half years ago now, you know how grief can distort time. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have a direct emotional response when this occurred. If to, the, to all appearances, I might've even seemed to not really be affected by it. And, I, and, I, and it wasn't even that I was um, behind the scenes suffering. It really was that I had really hidden it for a while, like it was mm -hmm. gone. And I'm sure that relates to what people can do with traumatic events in childhood. Mm -hmm. And the psilocybin was, I have a video where I, I tried to sort of articulate how psilocybin really forced me to go through what felt like the five stages of grief without wishing to. Like I, I, I did a mushroom trip thinking it would be a, you know, I'm a, I'm a 20 year old going crazy on mushrooms, right? And here I am, you know, having a sacred experience feeling as if I need to reconcile the passing of my grandfather with, you know, my own feelings about paternal lineage and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. the true profundity and like awe you have at real obliteration, uh, mm -hmm. things like that, that, that you're able to bury so easily are so hard to bury on these substances. And that's, that's why I don't currently have uh, yet at least a, a video of me really going through a psilocybin experience, because in my view, a lot or, or many true psilocybin experiences are just really powerful narratives that you're just, that are, are, are like you said, you, you call them the, the, the washer, right? The celestial, say that again? Celestial washing machine. Sounds fantastic. It's like you're clean at the end, but you're still shaking up. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to go through the agitator for a while. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I don't know what setting you have to turn it to. Different people have to do tumble dry, different sheets, you know. <laughs> uh, I think right. that might be a different lever for everybody. That's a great example, though, Quentin. What you talked about is blocking the feelings. In this case, your grandfather's death. A lot of us do that. Not everybody, but a lot of us do it. It's pretty common. I know I did that when my father died. I blocked the feeling. It was very, it was eerie. I like it was like, where is the emotion? There should be emotion here, and yes. it wasn't till you know other times that I could understand the grief and 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 feel the grief and realize it. Um, so we do that. It's and it's not wrong. It's actually right in a certain way. It's a self protection device, a self protection mode. What we're doing is we're just trying to protect ourselves, and it's a natural thing. And this is what we do as children too when we get hurt is we do a self-protection thing and uh, it blocks us. The thing is that the downside is that it blocks us off from the world. It blocks us off from expressing our feelings and feeling other people's feelings and behaving in these ways and having to, you know, do the addiction is somehow get that, that comfort. So uh, it's, but this uh, not feeling grief is a good example of how we do something to protect ourselves because it's just too painful at that time. We just can't do it. 
And um, now as this relates to really the a large topic in your book, childhood adverse experiences or trauma. So I can, I can imagine that I can, I, I want to be upfront with my audience. I can't say that I've had a, a profound resuscitation of a childhood traumatic experience yet on, on psilocybin or, or anything of that nature. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean it's, you know, out for the future, but yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm curious what you think, what you think the nature of psychedelics are that they allow us to, to sort through these things, to, to sort through these childhood experiences after we've taken this molecule. Right. Um, I think a guide can help because there's a lot of resistance, there's natural resistance, what I was just talking about, like with the grief, about walling it off and blocking it because it's just too painful. Um, uh, So the substances help open up. Uh, They're very powerful. That's, you know, that's what they do. But the guide can help you. Otherwise, there's just a lot of resistance to do it. Uh, So it's kind of, that's the combination that I think that works so well is having that person there who's a loving, uh, supportive uh, person, but skilled can help you find those uh, places and help you start to open up. And so it's a slow process. Start, we'll work there, we'll go there. What happened then? And you know, and then uh, um, take your time. Um, but, and then the medicines are very powerful. Healing, they're healing medicines. That's what I look for them. I don't look for them, look at them as um, places to have fun. I look for them. Uh, sacred medicines uh, to heal us and also spiritual growth understand the world you know is it just uh you know is it just a materialism i don't think so uh, but they can help you with those experiences and understand more mm. okay I- i'm curious if you'd like to talk about that for a second what i i would also say that i don't consider myself a, a strict materialist and if by materialist i mean basically that we live in a world of purely inanimate stuff um what what are your views on what, what the hell's going on here? You seem to maybe maybe know a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, I can just say what I think I know and um, or believe um, or what my experience is, I guess is also fair to say. And for a long time, I just thought, especially trained as a scientist as I am, you know, I thought, well, you know, there was a part when I was younger, I, especially maybe with the peyote, I had kind of a mystical feeling. And then, you know, as years went by and I left those uh, – substances behind and there's you know career and family and all that i kind of in the science kind of get material was getting kind of materialistic and um you know and then like you know and then of course the big question is you know who am i what am i and then what happens when you die you know is it just lights out boom that's it or is there something else is there something and why do i know i exist yeah what is consciousness um and that meditation can help with that but also these medicines can help with what is consciousness you know who's actually watching um who who is the observer who's moving these hands and feet and who's um, noting the observer well yeah well, who's who's noting who's watching who is the observer i w- i would say it um not the you know not the eyes and the the sensations but uh, some uh, difficult to articulate maybe, but this presence that's behind everything, um, that, that's the foundation of our consciousness. And that, you know, some people in religious traditions would say, uh, that's the undying. That's the part that doesn't die when your body dies. And that's the part that can go into other spiritual worlds. Uh, maybe when your body dies, maybe come back or maybe go somewhere else, another plane or uh whatever uh but um that's how i see see the world and um uh, i like this uh, quotation from it's actually from a 19th century rabbi who went on a retreat he said the uh the whole world is a very narrow bridge and the most important thing is to have no fear at all mm. and so if you think about the world as a narrow bridge we're just passing through it's a narrow bridge, you know, we go here, we, we, we come in, we start there, we go there. It's just a narrow bridge, we just go through it. And um, it's not like the big thing, it's not like the whole thing. And then if you take that perspective of the spiritual life, then there's no reason to fear. Because you don't, you know, the body grows old and die, and you know, what's so special about this body, you know? And then the ego, and that's one thing we can work on too in uh, psychedelics, 
is this notion of ego. And what is ego? It's like and, you're reading um, my mind. I was just about to ask and, you. Yeah, and, um, and that's something uh, we can work on. Meditation, I think, can also help observing um, ego-centric thoughts and actually working on, like, well, who's, you know, uh, am, I really, uh, am I really separate from you, uh, Quentin, or from anybody else? And are, aren't we really just part of one thing? And um, so I think the spirituality that um, psychedelic medicines can help with, um, especially with healing, is to, is to get a feeling that we're all connected. 